What's going on, everybody? This is Sean with Strangeland Oddities, and I am with Mr. Adam Green. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing pretty good besides this cold-ass weather. Yeah, the weather is uh, frightful. Definitely. Now, I have to ask you, now, where did the ins- the inspiration of Victor Crowley come from? Did it come from, like, personal experiences, or did you just want to shock the horror industry? Uh, I came up with Victor Crowley when I was eight. I was at summer camp, and it was the only time I went to summer camp. It was a terrible experience. I thought it was going to be, like, maybe playing sports or touching boobs or whatever, and instead they had us cleaning toilets and scrubbing floors. And uh, side note, uh, when I was first doing festivals with Hatchet One, I would tell this story, and somebody, I had said the name of the camp, which was Camp of Voda, and someone in the audience said, do you speak Hebrew? I said, I, no, I don't. And they said, Avoda means work. So my parents literally sent me to camp work, which you would think my people would have had enough with concentration camps, but apparently not, not for my family. Um, But the counselors there had said, stay away from this one cabin or else hatchet face will get you. And that's just the cabin where they drank and partied. But I was already into this stuff. So I was like, who's hatchet face? And like, what's he going to do? And that was all they had was a name, hatchet face. And I'm like, this sucks. So that night, as we were falling asleep, the other kids in the cabin were like, do you think Hatchet Face will get us? And uh, I'm like, you know who Hatchet Face is, right? Like he was a little boy and he was deformed and the house caught fire and his dad was trying to chop down the door to save him and he hit him in the face and now he haunts that area. And all these kids started crying and they had to call my parents and they were gonna send me home from camp, which I wish they had. And uh, that was it and it stuck with me forever. So the first draft of Hatchet was actually called Victor Crowley, um, and I know I'm supposed to have a better name, or I should say a better story for where the name came from, but it just sounded cool. And um, but John Beekler, who did the effects on Hatchet One, was like, "That can't be the story. When people ask you, you need to say that there was a guy in your neighborhood named Victor Crowley that used to like skin cats and like molest kids." So. Uh, Victor Kylie was a guy in my neighborhood who used to skin cats and molest kids. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, what made you choose, and, and how hard of a process was it to get Kane Hodder to play Victor and Scream Queen uh, Daniel Harris uh, for your main parts? Uh, well, uh, I did not want Kane. He just kept begging. And uh, finally I was like, all right, whatever. Um, no, actually... As much of a fan of Kane Hodder as, I mean, as we all are, I never even thought of that as a possibility. And we were in the makeup effects lab, and John Beekler had said, I'm going out to the set of Devil's Rejects today. Do you want me to show the script to Kane Hodder? And I was like, yeah. Are you kidding me? And then Kane, you know, I I think he and I met at the right time. Like, I was just getting started, and here was a guy who had just unceremoniously lost the the role of his lifetime when he was recast in Freddy versus Jason. And here comes this new character that unlike Jason, he would get to play from the ground up. Like nobody else has ever played Victor Crowley Four movies now. And, uh, and thankfully he gambled on me and it it worked. Danielle had actually auditioned for Mary Beth and Hatchet one. But at that point I had Kane Hodder. I had Tony Todd. I had Robert England, Josh Leonard from Blair Witch Project, Mercedes McNabb from uh, Buffy, and I mean, there were just so many icons in the movie already that I felt like if if it was one more, no one was going to take it seriously, that that was going to be, because you know, we all see these movies that are basically the horror convention roster, like they just, you can tell that the filmmaker walked around and like made offers to everybody appearing. I want you, I want you. <laughs> yeah, and um, I just didn't want it to be that, not right out of the gate. And so I made a huge mistake and passed on Danielle and hired somebody else for Mary Beth. And we eventually, from doing all these conventions, you become friends. And she and I are very close friends. We have a lot of the same like ailments and stuff. We have so much in common. And when it, when it became evident it was not going to work out with the original actress to come back for Hatchet 2, um, which to dispel any rumors about that it was literally just her agent trying to like they thought well they can't make the movie without you so we're gonna beat them up on money 
and it's like, well, no, we can make it without you, and we'll replace you with the biggest scream queen of our generation. So mm -hmm. keep keep playing the game. And the guy kept playing and lost. And when I called Danielle to offer the part, I mean, I had to eat shit because I didn't cast her the first time. And that's all she said was, she said, admit you were wrong. And I'm like, I was so wrong. And then the role went to Danielle. Nice. Yeah, I, I couldn't really picture anybody else playing Mary Beth. She does such a, an amazing job in her character. Well, not in the first one. <laughs> it's someone else. <laughs> Um, now, who comes up with the death scenes, um, and how do you make it so realistic? Well, uh, I mean, I come up with all the deaths. Uh, I mean, really, I come up with everything as the as the writer. Um, but you know, they're not really supposed to necessarily be realistic. They're supposed to be. It, the rule has always been it has to be practical in the old school way, and not a lot of CG, and not not that kind of cartoony. But there are very few deaths in any of the Hatchet movies that could actually happen in real life because I just wanted it to be fun. Because at the time, like you got to remember when the first one was being made, it was 2005 when we were shooting it. Yeah. And at the time, everything was either a remake, uh, a found footage movie, or torture porn. And the torture porn thing, I think everything has a place. And I welcome all of it, no matter how depraved or disgusting, as long as you're not raping people or killing animals just to try to push buttons then kids. yeah there's certain things where it's like if you're going to do that there better be a really good reason for your story that that had to happen and oftentimes there isn't um but aside from that i think that there's room for all of it but the torture porn thing just wasn't for me i didn't get into this because i liked seeing somebody in pain for 90 minutes and you know, I wanted to see an unstoppable villain. I wanted to see cool makeup effects. And I wanted kills that were going to make me laugh and cheer and clap and be like, oh, my God, that was crazy. And so I just made the movie I wanted to see again. And thankfully, there were a few million people around the world that <laughs> felt the same way. But I can tell you, Hollywood did not get Hatchet. Like, when that script went around, everybody passed. It got me a lot of jobs. But they would all say the same thing, which is, pick one is Too it supposed violent. to be funny or is it supposed to be graphically violent because you can't do both and i'm like why um but statistically horror comedy usually does not break out i mean there's a ton of examples of where it did american werewolf and Shaun of the dead and fright night evil dead evil dead but when evil dead first came out it, it was not a hit no. and so nobody wanted to touch this and so we made it independently. When we screened it, they still didn't get it. And then it was, it was 18 months of like festivals and conventions and winning awards. And then we finally got theatrical distribution. But um, I don't know what I was thinking. Like, <laughs> I mean, I was like eighty thousand dollars in debt and credit cards by the time that thing came out. But I just oh, wow. would not give up. And I don't necessarily recommend that to anybody. It, it paid off in my account, but. Um, if everyone is rejecting your movie, maybe it's just make another one. Like, don't do not do what I did. <laughs> nice. Now, with Victor Crowley, um, I was talking, I had an interview with Kane, and uh, he was telling me that with Victor Crowley, you were focusing more on Victor's face and his facial expressions. What made you decide, uh, compared to all the other Hatchet movies, what made you, you know, go that route to focus more on Victor and his emotions? Well, it's two things. One is that, you know, if you show your villain too much right out of the gate, he's not scary anymore. And that's what we saw happen with all the 80s slashers. Because at a certain point, they become the reason why people are going to see the movie. They're the hero. They're the one that you want on the t-shirt and the whole thing. And so the, with the first three, I tried to be very, very selective with when I would show him and when I wouldn't. And with this one, I was still selective. But not only was it, you know, everyone's there to see him. They know what he looks like. But the makeup has gotten so much better. You know, we've always, like, perfected it a little bit more and a little bit more. And this one was really the same makeup as 3, but there were just little things about it that were just slightly different. And some of that was the silicone on his face. So you could really see Kane's performance. Every little twitch, every little move, it all red. And so... 
I wasn't afraid to, to linger on a space longer because you can look at it all day and believe that that's Victor Crowley. If you did that in the first movie, it looked like a guy wearing a mask. I mean, it was, it's just the, we used um, foam latex in the first one and it was so thick that no matter how he moved his face, one side of it just stayed as one big piece. <laughs> so we had to try to hide that in shadow and we even did some things in After Effects in post where we would make that eye blink because it was supposed to be a dead eye. But when you looked at it for too many seconds, you it just felt like it was a Halloween mask. And so we would just squeeze it in post to make it blink. And technically that's sort of cheating because it's not really CGI, but it's still digital. So normally we only use digital to like erase wires or fix a mistake like the boom went into the shot or something but we don't use cgi blood or anything although they did use a little bit of cgi blood in the third one uh which i w i'm not credited as director on that one so i let that go but uh, i wish they hadn't yeah when i interviewed uh odorous um your youngest stay brocky back in 2010 when i said you know what did you name your you know bloody pit of horror he said after he stole it from a movie when there was no CG trickery, yeah. <laughs> as he put it. Um, which I, I have a actual question about Brocky. Um, now, when I interviewed Brocky, I was working for a tattoo magazine, so I got to see him outside of the costume, and I got to see him, in, you know, as odorous. And of course, they put on an amazing show. And with your show, Holliston, he was your alien friend in the closet, and. You know, obviously, unfortunately, Rocky passed away. Um, now, I know that had to affect the whole cast of Holliston and everybody. Um, now, is Holliston coming back? And how are you going to take away Rocky's character? Um, yeah, we are going to come back. Um, I'm just, I'm not ready yet. Like, we've we've started and stopped several times now and um like with that show i it's not like there's a writer's room or a whole team of writers which you would normally have on a sitcom like that like it's it's just me and then through the rehearsal process the cast kind of serves as my writer's room with like figuring out what jokes could be punched up what's not working um and every time we've tried i mean i wrote an entire season at one point that it just wasn't right like it i still had to work out so much stuff about about dave um and i just uh i'm not saying it like because i was closer to dave than anyone else in the cast even though i was uh but i'm the one who has to do scenes in that bedroom set where the closet door is not gonna not gonna open anymore and um, I can't do it yet. So when I can, we will continue. And um, I think it's, I'm very grateful that I'll, that the fans seem to understand that and they'll they'll get it when, well, when it's time. He was such an iconic figure for so long. And yeah, I mean, you know, especially, you know, just recently with Gunner, you know, people understand that. Or and George, or Wes, exactly. or Toby. Uh, it's it sucks getting old, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, I don't know if everyone realizes though that Odorous's character wasn't. You know, even though he's only in the show usually once, maybe twice an episode, he was also, in a very abstract way, he was the voice of reason. He's, you know, the Adam character is the main eyes into that world, and even though Odorous's advice was always terrible and misguided and wrong it was through that advice that adam would figure out how to live his life and the way season two ended odorous gives adam this big speech about not giving up and that you got to hold on for one more day and it's the only serious moment the character ever had and um that was really the theme of the third season the way it was written with odorous in it was that a lot of it was that adam has to start figuring out things for himself and not lean on him so much uh, and they sort of start to grow apart as characters. Um, and so everything's different now. And I'm not going to replace him or even like add a new character that's like that or anything. It's just we're going to address it in the first episode. And that's been written for a long time and won't change. 
Um, but it's one of those things where no matter what we do, it's either going to be too much or too little. Um, I'm hoping too little. I hope people say that was it. Like, because I don't want to make the whole season a memoriam. I don't like right. the show needs to be the show and the show needs to go on and it can't be the way I am about it now. Um, so right. when we're ready, we'll, we'll go. Awesome. Yeah. Cause that's actually a, a really good show. I, I've heard some people say, which th- it's the big bang meets evil dead, but yeah. I mean, one of our first reviews said it's the show you wished big bang theory would be. And that's obviously coming from like from a horror fan but we like to think of Halston as a show a sitcom for people that wouldn't watch sitcoms because that's what it really is to us I don't watch too many sitcoms I watched Seinfeld back in the day or like All in the Family is incredible Golden Girls um, but a lot of it I mean if, especially if you're not used to watching a play like that with the the laugh track and the, the like the whole live feeling of it it's it's weird so there's a whole generation coming up now that had never really even watched the sitcom until that show and so the laugh track threw them off they're like what the, what is this this is so weird right. and with season one we tried to make fun of the laugh track by purposely using the same laughs over and over again <laughs> which we thought was funny but we dropped that gimmick with season two and made the laugh track but well, we used more of the real laughs that we were getting because we do perform in front of a very small audience because there's no other way to know how to pace the jokes and when to pause and how long um so normally what we do is we rehearse in front of our shoot i should say in front of maybe 20 30 people that's it and most of it is the crew and they're allowed to laugh as needed and then we do a take without with just silence and that way we have the audio clean and then in season two, there's a lot of moments where you can hear the actual audience or people actually yelling things to us and stuff that we left in. And I think it made it a lot, just a lot more polished, I guess. Hmm. Okay, gotcha. Now, this is coming from a fan, um, a Michelle78 uh, from Instagram. She said, if you were ever to do another scary sleepover, who would you have over? Wow. Um <laughs> The hard thing with that show is now that it caught on, there's people constantly asking me to come on. And the beauty of that show is that everyone who comes on is a close friend of mine. And that's why they're so willing to open up and be so honest and why the chemistry is automatically there. And there, there's been talk about moving that series to a different platform and having a budget and all that stuff. Cause we just, we do it for free just for the fans, which is why we're stopping it for a while now. It's just, it's way too hard. It's like 60 hours of editing a week when we're in season on that. And that's on top of whatever movie you're making. And like, it's, it's, it's unbearable. Um, and we had at one point asked for donations from fans. And of course they don't do that. They just send all these letters about where is it? Where's the next, why is it? Um, that's the hardest thing about making stuff in this day and age is there's this entitlement now that everybody should get whatever they want and it should be free and they should never pay for it. And it's like, well, how is this shit going to get made? It's not even about us getting paid. Point is, um, uh, I've had to say no to so many people and I feel awful about that. But if I don't know you already, then we, we don't have time. We don't have time to sit there and get to know each other and build up a rapport and become friends and then shoot it. Right. So, um, I mean, there's, uh, let's see. Well, like Ari Mihailov is somebody that, because and Tyler Maine for a scary sleepover because both of those guys have backgrounds in wrestling which is something that I don't know a ton about other than what they've told me right. and I uh, I just think the conversation about that's I mean like Tyler Maine wrestled Andre the Giant think about that that's like crazy. I want to <laughs> see that episode you know like everyone knows him as Michael Myers now but right. um, as Nitro that's a whole different story and a whole different <laughs> lifetime and so I really I might just have to have that sleepover with him anyway, even if we don't shoot it, just because I have so many questions. <laughs> and when you like see a guy who plays such a vicious character and who is so violent in his entertainment, and I don't know if you've met him before, but just the nicest, sweetest, happiest guy. And um, I love it when people get to see who these vicious killers really are in real life. Because uh, Bruce Campbell says it the best when he says... 
he's met a lot of people who played good guys and a lot of people who played bad guys, and most often the guys who play the good guys are the assholes in real life. Yep. And it's it could not be more true. It is. Yeah, from most of the interviews I've done, all the villains or the bad guys or the killers, they're sweethearts in person. Yeah. I mean, Kane, he's really awesome in person. You know, Mosley, great. You know, speaking of R.A., he was telling me about um, the Hollywood Ghost Hunters. Um, he said that you were a part of it. and I'm a part of it. I just don't ever take part in it. I guess that's the right word. I've gone on maybe two hunts and my thing was I really wanted to take that seriously because I want I want proof. I want and for it to be proof, it has to be something that is undeniable like there is no other explanation. And the first place that we hunted was supposed to be where the Manson murders happened. But we find out halfway through the hunt that it's the house next door to where the Manson murders happened. Oh. And this dude is claiming the ghost moved over there when that house was, when Sharon Tate's house was torn down. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. And this dude just wants to get his movie greenlit about the murders. So that's why he's inviting people to do this. So you can see what's happening here and that we're being manipulated. And then we, they're looking at this shot where something floated by the, the lens of the camera. Homeboy's got five cats in that house. Like, you can't tell me that there's not a good chance that that was cat hair. And Rick, who runs the group, is like, ghost, there we go, got one, got a ghost. I'm like, Rick, that's cat hair. Like, it's so, uh, yeah, um, so I haven't gone on many since then, and, uh, but I support it 100%. I think it's a great idea, and I'm very proud to be part of the group, but... Um, I was just getting so frustrated where they were like, this is evidence. It's not evidence. Arwen knows what I'm talking about. Yes. Yeah, I know. Guest appearance here. <laughs> what are you barking at? <laughs> the cat. Oh, she heard cat hair. Arwen, <laughs> shh. shh. They'll, they'll ask you a question, too. Don't worry. She's like, this interview's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Now, fun fact about the uh, Hatcher 2, I don't know if anybody knows, but Lloyd Kaufman made a small cameo in that. Yes, he did. Um, oh, when you're going to get stepped on. <laughs> and I have a dog at my feet. A very cute dog, by the way. Oh, she's out there. Oh, oh, there she is. Whoops. Hey. <laughs> That was our animal cam cameo for the day. All right. Now, um, let's talk about Perry Shin. Now, what made you decide to, you know, in each hatchet, have him as a different character? Um, I learned quickly in the first one that not only is he one of the best people I've ever met, but he's one of my favorite people to work with. Everyone loved his character, and... Uh, I had already had it in mind because his character mentions his brother hooked him up with the job because the whole point of that character had to be that this is only the first or second tour he's done and he does he has no idea what he's doing and so I, I, I thought the brother was going to be in the second one not in such a big role it was really just going to be like to see where the other brother worked and that he worked for Reverend Zombie but after that point it was like well, he's got to come back in the third one, and we just have to keep the gag going. Now, from three to four, I had his character bring us in because uh, something had to connect the, the movies besides Mary Beth. I needed Mary Beth to take a back seat so that it could be about something else. Um, but, yeah, that was where the whole repeating Perry thing came in. And another fun fact about Adam, I don't know if anybody knows this, but he is a vocalist in a metal band called Haddonfield. Have you played any big shows or events, and where can we find your music? Uh, well, you can find the music anywhere where music is sold. Um, and online, it's Amazon, Google, Spotify, all that stuff, it's there. Um, or you can get the, the CD or the record. The record sounds best and is awesome. Um, and yeah, Haddonfield has been around now for 20, I guess just about 20 years, a little over 20 years. And I kind of gave it a major back seat when I moved to LA from Boston in 2000. And 
it was like even less than a side project for me. But uh, anytime I would let people hear it, the response was always really positive and I always missed it. And so on my podcast, we had played two of the songs during a, a benefit we were doing for a Yorkie rescue. And the response was incredible. And then the right people kind of heard it. And then the next thing you know, we're getting offered like a, basically a record deal. And I was like, where the fuck was this? <laughs> like at the time, like 18 years ago. Um, and so we decided, all right, well, let's release what we had because we never did. And even though, because you know, they're live recordings. And so we did that. And um, this past October, we did Rock and Shock with, um, with Ministry and Motionless and White. And, oh, um, love those guys it was just like it was like we never missed the beat you know like because we were used to playing big shows and uh and that's the hard thing is it's like anybody out there who's ever been in a band a real band not a cover band not your high school band like a real band that was making money and was part of your career at one point whenever you say to somebody yeah i had a band and they say oh i had a band too you instantly just want to strangle them and it's so hard because you sound like an asshole if you're like no i had a real band like no like you don't want to say that so i never talked about it because it hurt it was like anytime i tried to say it and someone's like oh, i was in a band i'm like oh, it was not the same it wasn't the same thing so now um, to get to actually i was in a couple of bands I'm, yeah <laughs> see i'm sure it was great no like maybe it was but uh it more just it, it 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 hurt because I missed it and like we were we were something like there was something there so to get to get it back in the forefront again and be doing it a little bit more regularly is great but I mean I'm the biggest problem with it because I'm so busy like I have, I'm doing so much stuff for my I guess I would call it my a career which is the filmmaking thing that um, I just can't I'm not gonna do clubs again I'm not gonna do I'd be willing to go back down to opener, which is what we did at Rock and Shock, because I feel like that's warranted and it's justified, and we shouldn't be headlining if we've been gone for that long, you know. Right. But um, but I'm not gonna do shitty clubs again or um, the pay to play things or like you know oh, like God, yeah. we had finished those days 18, 17 years ago when we were only headlining. So um, we'll see what happens if more big shows like the one we just did come up. We'll do it. And uh, maybe a tour, but I don't know. It, it like the money would have to be there, which is a shitty thing to say. I know, but like you're talking about four dudes who have children, some of them, and like livelihoods to to, to make and careers to, that they'd have to step away from to do this. And yeah, once you have that family, it everything your priorities gets are harder. completely different. So uh, we can't just go tour to do it. So. Um, We'll see. We've we've turned down two offers so far for regional tours, and um, I am noticing a pattern that each offer is getting better. So you never know. Maybe it, maybe it will happen. I would I would fucking love to do it if I could. I would love it, but we'll see. Hopefully. Now let's talk about this hot sauce of yours. Now, what made you decide to make a hot sauce, and how hot is it? Um, that's a really good question. Basically, I just, I just fucking sold out. You know what I mean? Like literally, that's what it was. It was the dude was like, "I make hot sauce. Do you want to do a hot sauce? Why not? Hey, if Joe Perry can have hot sauce, then Adam Green can have hot sauce, right? Because like Joe Perry makes enough money, and it's like, no, there's no money in it. Like it, we're gonna sell what 100, 200 bottles or whatever, probably tops. Like I don't know. We're just getting started. The very first bottles of that hot sauce. We're supposed to be sold today at this convention, but they didn't arrive because of the weather. So tomorrow we'll have them. Um, but I, you know, the whole sideshow sauce thing, they're the place who does it. Um, I just really liked the guy who, who asked. And um, where they got me was they offered to donate a dollar of every bottle to the charity of my choice. Oh, Most nice. of the stuff I do is for charity. And um, uh, Save a Yorkie Rescue is a very big one for me because my Yorkie saved me. And so once I realized, okay, any bottle sold, like, is going towards that, like, how do you say no? So that's really, to me, what it's, what it's really about. Um, and if people like it, great. I'm not the biggest hot sauce guy, to be honest with you. Um, but uh, they sent me some of it that I got to try 
beforehand and um it's fucking good like it's really good so uh i'm excited about it i've never sold hot sauce before um <laughs> there's another thing coming in a few months that i'm really excited about that's another food product um but yeah it was the charity thing that got me to do it and why not it's it's like it's a novelty item for fans to have hatchet hot sauce that's really cool i mean like the walking dead they have everything now I mean, why not? Walking Dead flamethrowers and, like, snowblowers and um, wine. wine, yeah. <laughs> so it's more just like, you know, a cane has a hot sauce, and I'm trying to think who else does. There's somebody else. And, like, if the fans like it and they ask for it and they want it and it's cool for them because – I'm still, I just, I've already dropped more money than I've made at this convention because mm -hmm. I walk around and I buy everything because I'm a fan and I want it. And it's, and the more abstract and weird, the cooler it is to have. So why not have Hatchet hot sauce? Um, but I do love to joke that it's like the ultimate sellout move, but that Joe Perry did it first. So uh, if, if Aerosmith's not making enough money that he needs hot sauce, I'm broke as shit. So uh, I, I can have hot sauce. <laughs> Now, speaking of Kane, Kane tells me that he is a practical joker. Have you ever been pranked by Kane, um, specifically maybe his Asprey? Uh, no, spritz, he, he usually gets Danielle with the Aspritz. Um, <laughs> the only prank, and I don't know how much he had to do with it, but I'm assuming a lot, that they tried to get me with was on Hatchet 2... Uh, Chris, who was one of the stunt uh, stunt guys, we had to do a thing with the double chainsaw kill where like two actors had to be in harnesses and flown uh, right. in the stage. And all of a sudden, they're like, hey, have you ever been in one of these harnesses? And I'm like, no, I haven't. They're like, do you want to get in it and see what it's like? And I'm looking around, and the whole crew has their phones out. And I'm like, how dumb do you think I am? You're going to put me up there and leave me up there while you all go to lunch. Like, it's five minutes to lunch, and ev everyone is suddenly here. So I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Like, right after lunch, let's do it. And they're like, well, no, 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 let's do it now. I'm like, so you can leave me up there? And they're all like, god damn it, how do you figure it out? I'm like, well, A, because I have half a brain. Um, but I think Kane was the one behind that. So they haven't really gotten me yet. Although he claims, this is my favorite, on tour for Victor Crowley, someone would ask this question, and he has a thing where he would always, like, pee or shit in somebody's trailer and, like, leave it in there. And someone was like, who did you get on Victor Crowley? And he's like, well, I didn't want to tell him in front of everyone. But it was Adam, and everyone laughs and cheers. And then I go, really? I didn't have a trailer on Victor Crowley. And he's like, oh, shit. So I don't know who got the Kane Hodder special on Victor Crowley, but I did not have a trailer. Um, so he still has not gotten me. This was actually uh, some funny outtakes from the Hatchet family. And uh, a couple more questions, and I know you're busy. Um, so what's the future of Mary Beth Dunstan uh, as she was in Hatchet? And you didn't really see her much in Victor Crowley until the very end. Yeah, uh, like I was saying earlier, for to go from Hatchet 3 to 4, the first three movies are one movie. They're cut together like one movie. They, they start and stop in the same frame that the other one ended on. And now this one is 10 years later. And I just don't want to keep making the same movie it can't always be the same thing so mary beth story-wise needed to take a back seat this time and then i needed to change the way that victor crowley comes back and modify the rules so i can get him out of the swamp moving forward so now he's that coming one of my next questions is he ever going to leave the swamp yes in hatchet five he will be leaving the swamp and he's going after her so it's and she's ready for him so now we have something interesting to move forward with and not just people going to a place that they shouldn't go in the first place that he can't leave and that's the thing with victor crowley just don't go to this fucking swamp like that's it don't go and he can't do anything to you well now he can and um i don't want to say too much else because i don't want to ruin it i i never should have even said he's leaving the swamp in the next one because now Spoiler alert. yeah but with this one one of the things i did differently was um, you know, the, the plane being such a big part of it. It's, it's like, uh, I don't know, a good probably 30 minutes of the movie, they're trapped in the plane. And some, some review online said, um, and I shouldn't complain because the review, it's the best reviewed movie I've ever done, I think. And, um, but it was like, 
something about how uh, they they needed to see the more of the swamp. You haven't fucking seen it enough at this point, and like, and you did still get the swamp. Like, you still got it, but now we had actual tension in a hatchet movie, which had never happened before. I mean, between the claustrophobia of the plane and Casey, Tiffany's character, stuck under those seats and the water's coming in and the choice of do we get off the plane and die or do we stay here and kill her? Um, and so every review says how much they appreciated that and that it, it was unexpected and it was something new. And then you get this one that's like, we needed to see more. <laughs> but you get that with sequels sometimes because people, they think they want to see the same movie they already saw. They just want that again. And it's never going to feel the same way as it did the first time. It just no, isn't. No. And you can raise the stakes and up the gore and stuff, but you need your story to move forward. So with this one, I got to create a whole new group of fun characters that weren't just there to be victims, like the SWAT team in 3 or the police in 3 or the, the hunters in 2. Like, you know when you're watching a movie, everyone is there to die. But let's have some fun with them before that happens. And I got to do that again with this one and really bring the heart of it back. So moving forward, um, it's all leading towards a very big standoff between Mary Beth and Victor Crowley. And the first time they had a standoff, it's really, um, and I hate to get this deep about a hatchet movie, but sorry. <laughs> um, no, this is great. They're both, they're both paying for their father's sins. Uh, that's the whole theme of this, is the sins of the father. Victor Crowley's dad cheated on his dying wife who put a curse on him and his mistress that created this deformed child that could never die. And it's all because of what his father did. His father also accidentally killed his own son. That was an accident, but part of the curse. And then Mary Best's father is one of the people who started that fire and did all this. And so there's that beautiful moment in three at the end when they're standing there in front of each other and they're both crying because they both realize that they have so much in common with each other. And it starts with just one look in Hatchet 1. Victor kai has got the shovel over Perry Shen's neck, and he looks at Mary Beth like he recognizes her, and she recognizes him even though they'd never seen each other before, and he blinks and she shoots. Um, every single thing has a purpose, whether people realize it or not. And so that storyline got to end with the ashes being spilled on him and him melting away and done. And remember, too, that was supposed to be the end. I did not want to do more after that. But life changes things. And so um, I ended up making another one, which is, might be the best one yet, compared, at least what people are saying. I don't know. Um, and uh, now I really have somewhere to go. And a, if, I, if I can just get to six, man, like mm -hmm. six, <laughs> five's going to be fucking great. But six? Oh, if I can get there. Six is a um, so stop pirating fucking movies and stop waiting for Netflix. <laughs> fuck you, Netflix. Start paying residuals to the artists or fuck off. Like, um, but that's my favorite. I'm a huge fan, man. When's Ding Up Tomorrow going to be on Netflix? You're not a huge fan, dude. It's been out for four years. It's 99 cents to watch it. You can do it. You can. You spend four times that on a fucking cup of coffee. You can do it. You can do it. Support the things that you want to see more of, and you will get more of them. If it's you, that if, easy. If you love this man's work. <laughs> Support his work. Don't pirate it. There are fans who go so out of their way to support everything, and they fucking buy everything we put out on that site, the hot sauce, whatever it might be. They are the mo You've never seen loyalty like this, but they're carrying the weight for a good, like, <laughs> I don't know. They're carrying the, the this, let's say, like 20% are carrying the weight for that other 80%. So stop pirating things and waiting for Netflix. Just stop it, these are indie movies and you don't get to make more unless they make money or at least make their money back and they do cost a lot of money to make um so yeah uh no one does these movies for the money like if i told you what people got paid on this fourth one you would be absolutely appalled you would never do it whatever you do for a living i guarantee you you would have quit before you would have done what we did um and we do it for the love of it, so support it. And, and, and if you don't like Hatchet, then don't support it. Let it die. But whatever it is that you do like, support it so that you can get more of it. And it's like hopefully trauma, we stay around forever. Know, trauma, they don't pay their, their actors. They're, no, they don't pay and, anybody. And they've but been that was, but that was That was Lloyd's model before there was even the <laughs> internet. So let's not... Let's not <laughs> Lloyd wasn't about... 
doing anybody any favors. Lloyd was about capitalizing on a very good situation and in turn giving people the best education they were going to get. Look at the people that came out of trauma. Fucking Trey Parker and Eli Roth and Joe Lynch and like Lloyd is a fucking hero. And uh, but Lloyd and I got into it fucking bad at Comic Con where he was supporting piracy. And I got so mad because I was the asshole on the panel who's like, no, I don't support this. You're killing all of us. And everyone's booing me. I'm like, yeah, fucking boo me. I'm like, Lloyd, if piracy had happened when the Toxic Avenger came out, <laughs> there would be no trauma. There would never have been a sequel. You would have never made another movie. So stop saying it's okay when your movies are so old that they already did what they were going to do. So, of course, you can be like, I'll pirate them now. I don't care. Like, um, and he came on my podcast two years later with his wife, Patty and admitted he was wrong. And uh, it was, listen to the episode. I fucking love Lloyd Kaufman so much. And I just, um, we're talking about, not that Lloyd's dead, but we're, <laughs> we're talking about people passing on and your idols leaving. And I hope Lloyd Kaufman lives another 300 fucking years because he is, uh, he's a fucking beacon to so many people, a beacon of hope, a beacon of do it yourself, of encouraging people to do it like, um, and we need that. You need that person who keeps telling you yes, which is what I've tried to be as well. I always tell people, you are a filmmaker. You can do this. If I can do it, you can do it. And it's true. You can. But everything about the world is always telling you no. And everything about the business is telling you the odds and how hard it is. And all you have to do is keep getting back up. And that's the hardest part because you are going to get knocked down. It's not going to work out. It's going to go really wrong so many times. But that one time that it kind of sort of almost works out. That feeling is worth all the times that you got knocked down. But if you can keep getting back up and not let it turn you into a bitter, jaded asshole, um, there is a world for you in this. Uh, but And if you have a, a shred of talent, um, that's the part no one likes to talk about. They're always right. like, you can do it. Some people can't. And uh, like, be honest with yourself. Maybe it's not for you professionally. Don't live a life of poverty and misery for no reason. If you've been doing it for five, ten years, and you haven't gotten a single inch of like success at it, maybe it's just a hobby for you. And that's fine, too. Um, but don't live a miserable life to try to prove a point that you're not going to give up. Uh, that's, not, that's not not giving up. That's being foolish. So, um, but just know that it's worth a try. And try. Do it. Go for it. Very well put. I actually had the, the pleasure of doing uh, uh, Lloyd Kaufman back in 2010 in Denver when he did Troma Palooza. And he actually took the camera out of my hand and uh, made my helper come in and, and be a part of it. And then he took the camera. He's like, he started like doing his little directing thing for my interview. And he's like, look at that. Your interview is directed by Lloyd Kaufman. <laughs> and I was like, that's awesome. That's awesome. You know, he, he's, he's a really awesome, really nice guy. He really is. Um, now, one final question. Um, you've been, you know, they've been, I've heard numerous times where people tell, tell me that you're part of the category of the splat pack, which is the group of filmmakers that brought back splat you know, gore and splatter like Eli Roth, Rob Zombie, James Wan, etc. You know, how do you feel about being characterized in that category? Uh, I'm very proud of that. And um, it's an honor to be included in any group with, you know, the people you just named. Um, I was unaware that I was part of it because the first article that was ever published with that term, I think it was in Time Magazine, and Alan Jones, who's a UK critic and a guy, one of the, the guys who runs Brightfest, he's the one who coined that phrase. And all of a sudden they're doing a documentary on it and they want to interview me. And I'm thinking to talk about the other guys and they're like, no, you're in it. And I didn't know. <laughs> so that's how I found out was when they interviewed me for the documentary. Um, and it, yeah, it's an honor. And um, I don't like, I... I do so many different things that I'm not, a label like that doesn't trouble me. You know, if that's what some people know me as, then great. I think that's awesome. Um, other people only know my comedy stuff. They don't know from the horror stuff. Usually when the cast of Holliston would do a convention appearance, a good 25% of the people in that audience were not horror fans. And they would walk around places like this 
freaked out and just wanting to get the fuck out of there. They just wanted to see the Holliston panel and leave, and I mm-hmm. love that. So, um, yeah, uh, I think it's great, and um, I don't know, man. I think whenever you first pick up a camera and you want to do this, what the most wonderful thing that can come from it is that you can make something that matters and that years and years later people still watch and still talk about and sometimes you'll see something brandished a hit like the prom night remake right i always use this as an example and i'm not shitting on the prom night remake it's just an example of a movie that did very very well when it came out never in your life are you ever going to walk around one of these conventions and see people cosplaying as one of the characters from that movie or wearing the t-shirt? It, no one will ever talk about it again. Um, and that was a huge box office hit. And then you have something like Hatchet, which was on a hundred screens, right? No one even knew it was in theaters when it came out. And at Monster Mania last year, I saw three people cosplaying as Victor Crowley. Oh, nice. Like, that was more than any other character walking around at that convention. And the Hatchet Army shirts and the tattoos and the, the hot sauce and the, the comic books and the, like, um, that is pretty amazing. And it means in some small, weird way that I will live, right. but I'll live forever, you know, like long after I'm gone, somebody will still watch that movie and maybe, maybe wonder who made this. Like, um, oh, that's Adam Green. Yeah, or they'll just say it was Lloyd Kaufman, <laughs> which I'm fine with, too. I'm fine with that. All right. And to wrap this up, um, you know, you just mentioned about, you know, Victor Crowley, you know, Hatchet Part 5. Um, besides from that, um, what else do you got in the works? I know you got your, your, your comic, your podcast. Um, anything else that your fans can expect? Um, lots of stuff, two, two TV projects. Uh, separate from Holliston. Holliston, uh, down the way, maybe more Hatchet movies. Um, I think the reason why the movies have lasted is that I always walk away and do other stuff for a while, and then I come back to it. So I have no desire to do another Hatchet movie right now. Um, uh, But nothing I can say, unfortunately. 